Thank you. You may be seated. On behalf of Larry and his children and grandchildren, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here and uh, every expression of love and kindness and support that you've offered to this family I know has been very meaningful to them, these beautiful flowers that you've given, and uh, of course your presence here uh, means so very much. And so thank you. We also thank the folks at the Hickory Funeral Home uh, for their care and uh, concern for this family and uh, their ministry to them during this time. Before we go any further, I'd like for us to pray together, and let's ask for the Lord's blessing upon this service. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for eternal life that is ours through Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross and the payment that he made for our sin and the power of his resurrection that secured for us our salvation and our hope and our life. We thank you that Loy Rao knew you as her Savior. And we thank you for your word that gives us assurance in these days to know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Father, we know that Loy is with you. And we thank you for that. And our prayer today is that we will honor her memory and her life our prayer today is that we'll be comforted by your word. And we pray that we'll be instructed by her example. But Father, we pray for those who may be here this morning and do not know you as their Savior. They are not ready for their appointment. They're not sure that if they died, heaven is their home. I pray that today they would receive Christ and be saved and begin to experience that eternal life that you offered to all who will receive it. And God, we pray that you'll guide us by your Holy Spirit and help us today to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Loy has requested that Casey Smith sing in her funeral service, and she made some notes about that. And one of the songs that has been requested is, It Is Well With My Soul. She's going to come along and sing that for us.
Well, amen. It is well with my soul. And I trust that it's well with yours. On Thursday, I found out that Loy Rao had been involved in an accident on Tuesday. And Julie had texted me, <laughs> but we had the wrong number. I have a number that begins with 308, of course, 828, 308. And she had 828305 because Larry had 828305. And so I didn't get the text. And I showed up Thursday because I had just learned of the accident. And I heard the report how that she had a broken sternum and a broken vertebra in her neck. And her lungs were beginning to build up, accumulate fluid. I immediately knew that this is not a good report. That she couldn't wear a neck brace because her sternum was broken. And the brace put too much pressure on the sternum. You need the brace for the vertebra to heal. It was a very difficult situation. Uh, Loy looked very uncomfortable in the position she was in. But she responded and she communicated and we talked and we prayed. And I know this, that though she lay in that bed of affliction and suffering, it was well with her soul. On Sunday, during the service, I got a text. And uh, the text said they've called the family together. And they've made a difficult decision because she wasn't progressing and it was evident. And so Loy was ready to go to be with the Lord. And uh, I got to the hospital room, and all the family was there. And uh, Loy was very aware and very alert, and she said, I'm going to heaven. She'd already told them, I'm going to heaven today. Well, the Lord had plans to keep her here a few more hours, didn't he? Beyond what she expected. She went to heaven the next morning at 10, just after 10 a.m., she knew where she was going. And her concern was not for herself, but for her family and for her church. She hated that she was going to miss and had missed the Easter Sunday services. She hated that she missed the Saturday community event that we had. Um, when I think about Larry and Loy, I know that they love the Lord and they love their church. And it was a great day when God brought them back to Tabernacle to unite with our church. And I'm so thankful that he did. Uh, in my almost 16 years as being the pastor here, you've been with me, Larry, most of the way. Uh, you, I think you came in that very first year. And uh, I'm so grateful that God brought you here. Um, you've been a blessing. And, you know, the two of them have been married over 61 years. So it's hard to talk about one without talking about the other, right? Larry and Loy. And they were one. God made them one. That's the way it should be. They've modeled that for us, haven't they? And uh, they've been a blessing. I, I made a few notes, and I thought about the fact that as their pastor over the last 15 years, they've never expressed a concern or a complaint to me one time. I'm sure they've had them. I know if I went to this church and had me as the pastor, I would have them too. And I have them with myself all the time, trust me. Ask my wife. Uh, my biggest critic is, is me. And but I appreciate that about them. They have encouraged me and loved me and prayed for me. And I've never had to wonder about where they stood. And I'm, I'm so thankful. They've encouraged God's people. They've been a blessing to our church. Their enthusiasm and their joy. And Loy maintained that joy to the very end. She did. She had the joy of the Lord on her face and in her heart. 
in her suffering, I, I didn't hear her complain one time. You know, the, the, she's been in the hospital a few times recently, as many of you know. And, uh, and then to get involved in this accident. And I thought, how much more can she take? But she didn't complain. What an example for us of what it means to walk with God. To love your husband because you guys loved each other. That was evident. You know, they, they were together. And I mean, they were together. They loved one another. They didn't just exist together. God gave them a love for one another, and it was evident. She gave us an example of that, and Larry, you did too, and thank you. What it means to care for your children. Their children love them. That's evident their grandchildren, to serve the Lord. You've set an example in serving the Lord alongside God's people. Your testimony and her testimony is a testimony of the faithfulness of God. You've been a faithful witness for the Lord. I saw him at the substation not too long ago. My wife and I went to the substation for the first time. We've been in Hickory all these years. And we finally discovered the substation, and guess who's there? You guys are there. And we're talking, and you were talking to another couple about all that God was doing in the church. And I mean, and when Larry gets to going, I mean, the body starts to shake, and, 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 and I'm and I'm like, I got to plug in to get a little charge myself. I appreciate that. And. Uh, the people at the substation knew them, knew them so well, they knew that the order was for them when you went to pick it up, right? And they said, is this for Larry and Loy? A tuna sandwich. I'm going to have to go eat a tuna sandwich <laughs> at the substation in memory of Loy. But when they found out you were in the hospital, she was in the hospital, they wanted you to know they were praying. You know why they did that? Because they knew you were real Christians. When you called to report the accident to the Farm Bureau, the people there said, tell them we're praying for them. You know why they said that? Because they knew they were real Christians. You know, we talk a lot about churches and all the problems in churches and all the hypocrites. I want you to know there are some real Christians. And these two modeled that for us, didn't they? Thank you. I was at the hospital, I think it was Friday. Uh, it was Saturday morning after uh, Phil Herman's burial. And uh, I went back to see Loy, and, and uh, it was just Larry and Loy, and we got to talking, and Larry was telling me about the opportunities that God had given them to witness to the nurses and the staff. And he was telling them, you know, you need to get in church and put your kids in a Christian school and <laughs> just going after it, you know, letting them know what they needed. And... Uh, Larry and Loy had a, a, a real abiding conviction about the value of a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. The pillar and ground of the truth. They built their lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ and his church. And they understood and valued the opportunity that God had given them to provide their children with a Christian education. And they did so with much sacrifice and hard work. Larry and Lloyd made sure their children had the opportunity to receive a Christian education. Larry told me that he has seen the fruit of that investment throughout their lives, and more so in the adult years, you told me. I, I, won't, I don't forget what you told me Saturday, because it helped me. He said, I've seen the, the, the fruit of that investment more in their adult years than I even saw in their childhood and teen years. You see, all the crops don't come up at the same time. But if you sow the seed, God's promised it will not return void. And Larry and Loy had a deep conviction of that, and I'm glad they saw that fruit. And I'm glad this family's here today. And they love the Lord and they love one another. That encourages me, and I hope it encourages a lot of you, especially those of you who have children, younger children, and, and you know what it is to struggle uh, bringing them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Larry and Loy 
told this story, or Larry told me the story, that he went to a bank at, uh, on the corner of Springs Road and I think 16th, right, where the Wendy's is. There was a bank there. And uh, he went there to get a loan. And uh, the banker told him that the best thing he could do for his family's financial security was take his children out of the Christian school. And he warned them they'd go bankrupt <laughs> if they kept them in tabernacle. They'd come to the banker that day looking for a loan. They got some unsolicited advice, right? Well, Larry responded by telling him that he was not going to take his children out of Tabernacle Christian School and that he no longer needed the bank's money. <laughs> you see, Larry and Lloyd looked to the Lord to provide, and God did provide, didn't he? And when I went to be with them on Sunday evening and the family was gathered in the room, not really being familiar with that story, I I asked Larry to come to the bedside and we prayed and I said, before we pray, I said, Lloyd, Larry, look around and their children and their grandchildren were there. And I said, I want you to see this room is filled with gold. This room is filled with gold. It means more than any amount of money that any bank has. And we prayed together and we thank God for the riches, the riches, the true riches, not the meat that perishes, but the true riches. Boy, I had the true riches. This family has true riches that will abide forever. The thief can't break through and steal. The moth can't eat and destroy the rust cannot corrupt what God has. And they rejoiced in the wealth that God had supplied them. And surrounded by her family, we prayed. And when I left the hospital, my wife was outside in the car. She dropped me off. She was going to pick me up. And uh, I said, God was in that room. As I left that room, I walked down the hall to go to the elevators. I knew God had been in that room. I walked out of that hospital. I said, God is in that room. He was with you that day. There's nothing more meaningful than that. That the Lord was there. And he was there with her. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's all that matters, isn't it? And he didn't leave her in that valley. He delivered her. Because now her faith has become sight. She is in heaven. She's in the glory land. You see, a funeral service provides us with opportunities. And let's take full advantage of this opportunity to reflect upon our lives. We all have this appointment. It's appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment. Are we ready for that? Are we prepared for that? To renew our relationships. You see, people come together. And we have an opportunity as we reflect upon our lives to renew our relationship with the Lord, to renew our relationship as a family, to draw close together. I pray that God will help you to do that. You're a very close family. I hope you'll draw even closer. Closer to the Lord, closer to his people. And then a funeral gives me another opportunity to rejoice in the promises of God. They become more meaningful, don't they? The day that my grandfather went to heaven, it was about 10 o'clock at night. I drove, I lived in town in Knoxville, and I drove to the outskirts of Knox County into Anderson County, and I drove uh, to his house, and my mother met me on the porch, and the look she gave me told me what I needed to know. He was in heaven. And I knelt beside his body with all this emotion. But then the grace of God swept over me. And I knew that he was with the Lord. 
And we can rejoice in the promises of God. Because our loved ones are there. And if we know the Lord, we're going there. And friend, I want you to know that Lloyd would not be happy <laughs> if anybody left here without knowing Jesus is Savior. The Bible says, He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto, the God, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. A tragic car crash led to her death. But just days before, she and Larry had gone to the funeral home to make arrangements. God was in that, wasn't he? The issues of the Lord, or the issues of death, God, God says they belong to me. He, he knew. He knew. He said, well, he could have prevented that. He certainly could have. But in his omniscience, in his mercy and his grace and wisdom, He chose to take her home this way. And we have no idea what suffering he spared her from that was waiting ahead. Maybe he just said, this is enough. It's time for you to come home. And so he took her to himself. And she is with the Lord. In these moments, then, we have to trust in the goodness and the mercy and the purposes of God. Just like Loy did and we learn from her life and we praise the Lord for it the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 25 speaking of the virtuous woman I think she qualifies don't you strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come well she's rejoicing isn't she she openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands. And let her own works praise her in the gates. Well, at this time, I'm going to ask Kim and uh, Kendall, if you want to come, both of you can come and just be here on the platform. You can have a seat if you'd like. And uh, Kim, of course, is Lloyd's daughter, Larry and Lloyd's daughter, and Kendall is Kim's daughter and granddaughter, and so they're going to share a few things with us. Well, I'm not in high school anymore, so I need these glasses. Um, um, as Pastor Hooks just said, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm the oldest daughter Kim, um, Terry and Philip and Julia would probably say I'm the bossy one, and that's probably true. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to say on behalf of, of my dad, Terry, Jennifer, Philip, Julia, Brad, and all of mom's adoring grandchildren, I would like to thank you for being here today. I think um, I mentioned to several of you, she, she, she would just be so honored, and I know that she's seeing all of this, and this, just to know that she was so loved would, would just make her so happy. So thank you for being here. This place, you know, this, this church, and this, even this building, has held a lot of meaning to, to the Rao family. Um, and we know that, that mom would just be so honored that we're all here together. I'm sure everyone present is familiar with Proverbs 31, and Pastor Hooks just, just referenced that as well. And 
I heard last night that my daughter is going to reference that too, and we didn't plan this together, but as I was sitting there listening to Pastor Hooks, I, I thought, what, what a goal that would be for me, you know, when, when I am buried, that somebody would re- reference me a- about being a virtuous woman like we are doing for mom. Um, but, you know, and each time I've heard a message or I've read this passage, I've, I've always just immediately thought of her. She was a wonderful example of a virtuous woman, especially to Julia and me. And 28 states, verse 28 states, her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. I know Pastor Hooks just read that as well. Um, I honestly think this verse describes her perfectly. And my siblings and I are just grateful for all of the things that our mother taught us, but especially how to live a Christian life. That was very important to her. It's difficult to talk about mom without talking about dad. To be honest, their names, Larry and Loy, just go together like peanut butter and jelly. And I think one thing that's always made me the happiest is just knowing that they have had each other for 61 years. They've set a wonderful example to us by always putting God first and then each other a very close second. Mom and dad continued to grow closer and closer year after year. And during the last difficult year or so, dad was always at her side. And we're grateful for that. Um, About a month ago, I was talking to mom on the phone and when she shared a sweet moment with me that reminded me of how God takes care of us. And, And I wanna share that with you. She said, your dad is so good to me. Last night, I was so thirsty, and I decided to get a glass of water. She went on to say that she carefully and quietly got out of bed and walked to the kitchen trying not to wake Dad. And she made it to the kitchen. She got her glass of water, and when she turned around to go back to the bedroom, you know, Dad was just right there standing, and he was, you know, he was concerned about her, and he... He followed her without her knowing, and he was there to just make sure that she was okay. It just warms my heart, especially today, that mom was so loved, and dad and mom loved each other just as Christ loved the church. And what a wonderful blessing that is. Mom was virtuous. She was loved and respected by all of her children, and she was faithfully loved by her husband. She was also somewhat shy until you got to know her. But what many do not know about my mom is that she was very quick-witted and just funny. Um, And we all loved that side of her And we even witnessed it during her last hours on this earth. We were gathered around her hospital bed when dad got up really close to her face. And he whispered lovingly, you look beautiful. She immediately smiled and said firmly, not today. (laughs) And then we all laughed and cried at the same time. As I stand here today speaking on behalf of my brothers and my sister, we're grateful that Loy Perlier Rao was our mother. We know without a doubt that she's in heaven rejoicing with loved ones who have gone on before her, including her infant grandson, Ian. Mom has always loved Easter Sunday, and 
it was really one of her favorite Sundays of, of the year. And this one was even more special. The family was all gathered by her bed, and we knew the Lord was calling her home. I leaned in and asked, and I leaned in and asked, Mom, who do you want to see first when you get to heaven? Thinking, she would say, Mom and Dad, right? She was very close to her parents. But her answer was immediately, Jesus. What an amazing testimony. We love you, Mom. I'm Kendall. I'm her youngest daughter. And I had a plan as to what I was going to say, and then the Lord just sometimes changes your plans. So um, there's something so sweet about mothers and daughters. And I think when I see my mom and recognize how great of a mom she has been, I often realize that a lot of it we owe to the one you call Loy, but I just, I just call her Mamal. And as I look around the room and I see all of these people, a lot of people, um, some of which I've met and some of which I haven't until today, um, there's people in this room that call this lovely lady Mamal, like all the ones sitting in the first few rows. There's four lovely individuals that call her mom. And there's one very lucky man that called her wife. And I think when we look around this room, if I asked each of you, how would you describe my Mamal? Some of you would say witty and funny, as she did have a certain sense of humor. Um, and others would call her loving and kind. And I think we all have different ways that we could describe her, but all of them are positive and beautiful. But when I think about her, um, there's one thing that just describes her better than any other way, and um, we've already heard a little bit about it, but it's that she was a God-fearing woman. And I think if you knew her, there's without a doubt, no matter if you knew her for you know 10 minutes or 10 years, or, or maybe it was 40 years, um, that was one thing that you didn't know my mama unless you knew that she loved the Lord. And both her and my papa, they, they set that standard in their marriage and everything they did. Their marriage was one of the most beautiful testimonies of the Lord's faithfulness. And I think you can see that as it stems into not only our family, but all the people in this room. So on Monday when I was driving home, I was listening to this worship song, and it says that Jesus is the best part. I think when I think about my mama, that was her life. And I think she did, maybe didn't use those exact words, but I think that is what she would say, is she'd say, Jesus is the best part of my life. I think Papa would probably agree that was the best part of their marriage, probably what held the glue together for over 61 years. So I'm going to read a scripture that has already been uh, referenced twice, but I'm going to read the entirety of it. And I love that I happen to be the third person to reference it, because the Lord often sends good things in threes. So if you would, just listen with me as I read about the woman who fears the Lord from Proverbs 31. An excellent wife who can find. She's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens out her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself, and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, so much wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and they call her blessed, and her husband also, he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you, Mamma, you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. 
Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. This is the word of the Lord, and I think it's one of the things that describes my mammal the best. It's the woman I strive to be, the woman my mom and Aunt Julie strive to be, and a lot of women in this room strive to be that, and a lot of that we learned from my mammal. So if you would just pray with me. Heavenly Father, I just thank you. Um, this room is such a testament of your faithfulness, and my mammal and papa's lives are that as well. I just thank you for her life, and I just praise you that she's now up there in heaven with you and looking down on us, Lord. I just thank you again for every single person in this room and that I know that Mamaw would love nothing more than to know that we left her celebration of life knowing you better and loving you more. So it's in your gracious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you ladies did excellent. And, you know, uh, oftentimes when there are more than one preacher at a funeral, we kind of compare notes, don't we, Brother Hefner? And we say, uh, where are you reading from today? <laughs> well, I should have thought about that. So my apology. But it's pretty interesting to note, isn't it? That all the three of us, independent of one another, that's where the Lord led us. So I think it needed to be said, didn't it? And, you know, uh, we're a little slow about getting things, aren't we? We have to be told time and time again. You ever said to your kids, how many times do I have to tell you something? Well, the Lord says something, that same thing to us, right? You, you ever fuss at your kids and then you, you hear this still small voice going, yeah, but what about you? You got the same problem. Boy, it's amazing how God works that way, isn't it? Well, that was great. Y'all did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, Casey, would you come and sing for us a wonderful song about heaven? Thank you, Casey. That was wonderfully done. Well, Loy had written a scripture passage that she wanted read at her uh, memorial, homegoing service. And so I want to read that. It was Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, with the emphasis on verse 16. 
and uh, I'd like to read it to you and just make a few comments, all right? Uh, the Word of God says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, that was the passage that she had written. That was a passage that no doubt she had turned to many times. A passage that encourages us to come boldly to the throne of grace. And I'm glad that she was able to come to that throne of grace. And if you know the Lord, I'm glad that you're able to come to that throne of grace. And if you don't know the Lord, I want you to know that you can come to that throne of grace today. And you'll receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, I thought about this passage and I thought, well, what am I going to say about this? What, what, what was Loy wanting to communicate here through this passage. How did God encourage her and speak to her through it? Well, I thought about three truths that I get from this passage that really I hope encouraged her. I know it encouraged her and I hope it will encourage you today. The first thing is we have an advocate with the Father. This is what this passage tells us. An advocate is somebody who is pleading on my behalf. Seeing then that we have a great high priest... What does the priest do? The priest appears before God on behalf of man. Well, our great high priest, he's not in a tabernacle. He's not in a temple made with hands. He is in heaven. He's not a son of Aaron, a son of Levi. He is the son of God. That's my great high priest. He's my advocate. And the Bible says in verse 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. The word infirmities means our weaknesses, our frailty, our sinful tendencies, our, the weakness of our minds and the weakness of our body and the weakness of our thinking, our inability to do what we need to do to please God. Paul knew that inability all too well. He said, I'm trying to do right, Romans 7, but I can't do it, and I try not to do wrong, but I keep doing it. Can you sympathize with that? I can. Well, in those times we have an advocate who's touched with the feeling of our infirmities when our hearts are breaking, when we're helpless. We have an advocate. When sin, the weight of sin and guilt and shame is upon us, we have an advocate. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He had no sin. You see, a priest had to be clean before he could come to the Lord. There's only one who's clean enough to come in the presence of God, and that's the Lord Jesus. He's my advocate. And in 1 John, the Bible tells us, the Bible says to us, uh, as John wrote, he said, My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, well, we know that all men are sinners, right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As gracious and kind as, as this woman was, do you know that she's not in heaven because she was gracious and kind? Because although she was gracious and kind, she was still a sinner. And the payment for her sin she could not make. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, Jesus Christ died and made the payment for Loy's sin and for your sin and for my sin. God made the payment. And Loy received that payment. She accepted the Lord Jesus. Terry was telling me he has a picture and, and has a, a note on it that Loy got saved in January of 1967. She wrote it. Well, that's a precious thing to have a hold of, isn't it? That's the day she received Christ. You see, she recognized that she was a sinner. But though she were a sinner, she had an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And the Bible said he is the propitiation for our sins. He made the payment for our sins. 
And in his righteousness, he appeased the wrath of God for our sin. When he died on that cross, he said, it is finished. The payment was made in full. The judgment of God, the wrath of God was poured upon him. The Bible says, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He bore our sin. He bore our shame. He took the sentence of death upon himself. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And she heard that message. And she responded to that message and she was saved. Now, Satan is the accuser. We have an advocate, but we also have an accuser. And the Bible says he accuses us before God night and day. Do you remember what he did? Hey, Lord, how can you love that guy? He blew it. How can you love that lady? She's blown it. She's made a mistake. But God said, I don't remember that. Why? Because I see the righteous record of my son imputed to their account. Faith, faith is the transaction that imputes the righteousness of Jesus to our accounts and removes our sin. Praise be unto God. And she came to Christ by faith. I hope you have. I hope you have. If you haven't, you can receive him today. The Bible says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the tongue confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's appointed unto men once to die. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If you died with everything in this world you ever wanted and went to hell, what good would it have done you? Nothing. Jesus died to give you true riches and to save you. And if you'll call on him in faith believing like Lloyd did, you'll have an advocate. And that's what we find in this verse. An advocate. And the Bible says in Hebrews 7 and verse 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Every day, Loy had an advocate in heaven. When she went in the hospital and we heard the report, she had an advocate. He was pleading for her, interceding for her. Some other truth that we have here is that we have not only an advocate with the Father, but we have access to the Father. In verse 16, the Bible says, Let us therefore, because we have an advocate, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Not only do I have an advocate, but I have access to God. I can get to him no matter where I am, no matter what I'm going through. I can get to God. And I can come boldly. That means I can come confidently to God and know that he cares and know that he hears my prayer and know that he has promised to supply all that I need according to his riches and glory. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, those who know the Lord are justified by faith. He said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We can get to God. We have access to him. He said, well, if we could have accessed the right doctors, if we could have accessed the right people, maybe, no, listen, we can access God at any moment and at any time. Well, that's a precious truth, isn't it? You see, we have an advocate with the Father. We have access to the Father. And then we receive assistance from the Father. I think that's what Loy was holding on to here. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Someone says that word grace. There's an acronym that they use to define it. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is God's unmerited favor. God set his affection on us. He loves us. That's his grace. We come to his throne of grace. Not a throne of judgment. Not a throne of condemnation. Not, not a throne of disapproval. A throne of grace. Boy, we need God's grace, don't we? A throne of grace. It will become a throne of judgment for those who reject Jesus. But it's a throne of grace if you come to him now. And what do we receive there? Mercy. What is mercy? It's when God withholds what we deserve. You know the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
The Bible also says that the wages of our sin is death. What do we deserve as sinners? We deserve death. Not just a physical death, but an eternal soul death in a place called hell apart from God forever. Prepared that place, hell, prepared for the devil and his angels. Not prepared for men because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God in his grace has sent his son to die for you. He sent his son to die for Loy. To save her. And she obtained mercy. And then she found grace to help in the time of need. It wasn't easy to raise four kids. It's not easy to get Larry out of a restaurant. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not easy to do all that stuff. The mundane days, the difficult days, the disappointing days. The sacrifices. It's not easy. We need help. Where do we get it? Just one place. From God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. She soared. I watched her. She ran. But God gave her strength and she didn't get weary. She walked, but she didn't faint. That's God's grace. And you need it and I need it. And she needed it. And that's why she said, I want this read at my funeral. Three truths that encourage me. I've got an advocate with the Father. I have access to the Father, and I get assistance from him. And then let me just leave this with you. There are two lessons to instruct me here. Because the apostle said in, in these verses, he said in verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, because I have an advocate passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession." Loy held that profession to the very end. Held that profession. UTIs and trips to the hospital. All through her life, she held fast to that profession. She didn't let it go. Let me just say this. If you know Jesus, don't let go of that profession. Live it every day. Embrace it. If you don't know Jesus, grab hold of that profession. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer asked. And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It's pretty simple. Profess him. Believe. Confess him. He'll save you. Hold fast to that profession. Don't quit. Don't quit. Hold fast. Well, that's one lesson. There's a second one here. And that one we find in verse 16. Knowing that we have a high priest, knowing that he is touched with the feeling of my infirmities, knowing that he is tempted to the same points as I am yet without sin, knowing I have a perfect advocate and I have access, what should I do? Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That's the second lesson. Loy knew what it was to come to God's throne room. And I know she spent a lot of time there. Now, I've never seen her there praying. I don't know that I've ever heard her pray. I haven't had the privilege of doing that. Well, then you might say, how do you know that she went to God's throne room of grace? You remember reading in the Bible when Moses went up to the mountain? And he spent 40 days and nights with God, didn't he? When he came down from the mountain, do you remember what the children of Israel did? They had to shield their eyes. Moses was shining because he'd been with God. The Bible says in, in the book of Acts, it says, speaking of those disciples and, and their preaching and their ministry, the Bible says they took note of them, they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. You see, when you've been with Jesus, you don't have to tell people. They know it. I knew that Loy Rao 
had been with Jesus. And I want to tell you, you and I need to hold on to our profession and we need to come boldly to God's throne of grace and let God shine his glory in our hearts and our lives. And that light shine for others to see. May God help us. Would you pray with me? Before I pray, I, I want to ask you, as I mentioned to you, a funeral gives us an opportunity to reflect. How is it with you and your soul? It is appointed unto men once to die. That's one appointment you cannot reschedule. You will keep that appointment. Every person that's ever lived has kept that appointment. And after this, the Bible says the judgment. Jesus came to appear for you at your appointment to suffer, bleed, and die for you. He made the payment for your sin, and his righteousness can be transferred, imputed to your account if you'll receive him by faith. Do you know Jesus today? Do you have the assurance that heaven is your home? If you don't, you can have it before you leave this room. As I read earlier, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon him? I mean called upon him confessing that you're a sinner and that he's the son of God, relying upon his death, his sacrifice on the cross for you and his glorious resurrection, and you acknowledge that he is the Savior and you confess your sin to him and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin and save me. I believe that you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Are you willing to do that today? If you're here and you need to do that, would you pray with me? You can borrow my words if you wish or you can use your own. But would you pray, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that you're the son of God. And you died on the cross and made the payment for my sin. You were buried and that you rose again the third day to give eternal life to all who believe. Today I'm coming to you. And like Peter, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin and to save me and give me a home in heaven. And friend, if you pray that prayer from your heart and you meant it, God said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not hopes to be saved, not might be saved, but shall be saved. That's a promise from God's word. When we leave here, there's a booklet that will be available to you at the information desk. It's a little booklet that tells you more about what it means to be a Christian. And those books will be available at the information desk. And I hope you'll pick one up. And Christian friends, as you think about Lloyd's life and testimony, aren't you challenged? I'm challenged. Let's hold fast our profession. Let's spend time coming boldly to God's throne of grace. Let's pray for Larry. Let's pray for his family. And let's ask God to help our church that we would follow this example. Our Father, we thank you for your word and the comfort we've received from it. I pray for your grace and mercy for this family and for all of us. Thank you for the many friends who've gathered here today. Bless and guide us now as we go to the graveside and then later as the family and friends return for a meal here at the church. We pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.